Hey folks, welcome back to The Pulse. It's 11 o'clock Central Texas time and we are back with Steve Staggs. It is episode number 21. Wow, I'm fired up for today. I'm really excited. I'm full, if you will, right? I'm full. What does that mean? Well, I'm really excited to, to share because we're going to be doing literally a review of the whole shooting match today. And it's it's really cool because it's a spontaneous practice of all of the things that I've been learning. And you get to learn with me, right? That's kind of the cool thing is we're just, you know, we're journeying together, feeling out the sides of the walls in this, in this room that we're in and kind of understanding what is the time, order, and rank of creation. How does it all fit together? But I think about the Wizard of Oz. Remember the Wizard of Oz? We're off to see the wizard. And what happened? They got into the room, right? Get into the room, flying monkeys. And what do they see? This big, great, powerful Oz. And there's this curtain. And they're like seeing the dog run over there, right? Toto goes over there. And what do we see? We see the fraud, right? But there's something about the pulling back of the curtain to understand what's going on. In that story, it was a fraud. What I feel like we're doing in this, what Steve's helped me do is to pull back this veil and say, you know what? All of the indicators of what really is going on is right in front of us. But we have an upside down view of it. And there are those who are trying to deceive us and lie to us. And the beauty of this time, these 21 episodes, is the fact that we're looking at it and really examining what is the structure of it. And because Steve Staggs was a professional baseball player, he's applied all of those things. Him fighting the lion and the bear like David himself is applying the same structure to how he you know, literally walks with Jesus. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to treat this like I'm a professional. And naturally, he's done that. And I think what's really incredible about this is, you know, the more you dig, the more you recognize that there's no bottom to this and that it is so rich and so powerful and so beautiful and what it um, it confirms itself. And he said a couple episodes ago, he's like, you can keep probing the truth. That's the beauty of the truth. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to probe the truth. But before I do that, I just want to share you. I, I took a little stock of what I've learned. Let me show you what I've learned. So I call this the true gospel, right? These are all the topics that I've learned from Steve. So let's just, I'm just going to run through this like super fast. And then we're going to bring Steve on. Jesus is alive and he speaks. That's like the basis for everything that I feel like enca encapsulates everything, right? The simplicity of this. Who are the Elohim? Who's Yahweh? What is the capital L-O-R-D? Jesus. The temptation. Man doesn't live on bread alone. I only do what I see the father doing. We are one, the Father and the Son. Listen to him, the ecclesia, who are the called out one. Seek me and you'll find me. If you seek me with all your heart, trust in the Lord. He makes your path straight. The high places with Jesus versus building up these things that we look up to. What is authority? What does it mean to inscribe? What does it mean to speak into existence? What is Satan in darkness? That it's not a surprise to God, that these things were actually intentionally put there. Whoa, blow your mind stuff. The prodigal son, the father who financed his son's debaucherous education so they would know his nature and character what is your interest and intent as it relates to who jesus is that that's a big big part of this what about the past and the present and the future and how this present engagement with jesus is literally almost non-existent within the church what about the time order and rank of all creation that you will do greater things than i this idea that we are an extension of like the the branches right the, on the vine the kingdom come, thy will be done. This purpose on earth as it is in heaven. The battle's not against flesh and blood. What does it mean to be proactive versus reactive? Getting you know, drawn off sides. That Satan is crafty and wants to draw you off sides. The self, what does it mean? And what does it mean to actually have self-control? Considering others, loving God, loving others and your neighbor. These things that are really, you know, come out of this. What does it mean to be lukewarm or have a form of godliness? What about Lydia and in Macedonia and the slave girl casting out the spirit of Apollo and this idea that what we thought we were here for is not really why we were here. What does it mean? The commonwealth of people. Jesus is a model for our own behavior, prayer, exchanging wishes. If anyone is sick, have him pray. Don't pray for him. Have him pray. We're facilitating something, exchanging wishes. It changes us in the game, amateur versus professional, this discipline or discipleship, holding every thought captive, reward in full versus in heaven. What does it mean? Will you have an appointed reward? What does it look like? Five cities, 10 cities? Upside down versus right side up, the very nature and the name of this. Light and darkness, contrast, absence of light, the way, the truth, and the life. 
living fully. What does it mean to live fully? Faith is given with a spoken word that's given to you, a packet of faith that comes with it. The seed, he who controls the seed controls the economic order. Whoa, time and the fullness of time and chronos time and all of this stuff coming together. Linear time, two sides of the same coin that we're actually living within, not only a physical, but a spiritual world. The peach, right? The peach on the table, the decays, we have to add energy to it. No, we're not going to add energy to this thing. All the tools are neutral. We animate tools for good. It is our intention. Authority was given to us by God. What? To do what? What are we going to do? What's our job? Right? Ruling over this in his nature and character. Sovereignty, freedom, choice. Jesus in the moment and how powerful that is. My whole experience with Christian entertainment, you have forgotten who you are in Jesus. Without me, you can do nothing. So the only way is within a partnership with him, the feeding of the 5,000s and giving everything that we have to Jesus and he multiplies. What is real stewardship? The classes of Elohim and angels and animals ruling and reigning. What does it mean? Overreacting and escalation, alignment with the framework, time, order and rank, carrying the ark, the picture of partnership with God, the transfer and the new economic order. How about them apples? That's a lot of stuff. I think Steve's like, yeah, I didn't realize we covered so much in such a short amount of time. What do you say, Steve? That's a lot <laughs> yeah. of stuff, man. That's, that's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Let me say thank you to you first off, because this is this is like the most spiritual growth I've had in a long time. And I told you mm -hmm. five days ago, it was my 23rd anniversary of having weight lifted off my back. And to think the last eight to 10 months have been tremendous understanding and growth and i believe god has literally sent you to me and said hey listen to this dude and i thank you for your the approach that you've taken you've encouraged me to ask him myself and that is like everything to me so thank you uh, i appreciate that matt and by the way that's how the that's how the kingdom of god works i mean you know he in this particular case he you know he sent me to you and had you and told you to listen to me. And that's what he does. Um, and so in other cases, others have done that for me. And yeah. so people who are on the stream, he'll do exactly the same thing with the folks on the stream. Every one of us has something in our history that is useful to another. And it's just a matter of learning to live in that fluid dynamic Jesus described it to um, Nicodemus as the wind. It's like the wind. So some, when you and I met, that was like the wind. Neither one yep. of us knew where that was coming or going, but man, when it met, it was absolutely, you know, divine. So thank you for that. And it's just the way the kingdom works. Wow. And it's good. And you know, you think about this too. I mean, I imagine myself in your shoes. It's like, you know, I've been talking to Jesus for a long time. Be nice to pass some of this stuff along. And I know you've talked to a lot of people, but, um, you know, I feel like the, you know, I feel like we're just getting started, Steve, to be honest yeah. with you. And, and then when I look at this, there's even more than that. I, I keep adding to that list, but it's like, wow. I mean, each one of these is like four hours of conversation that we could have about every one of those topics. Yes, every one. Yes. Yep. They're deep and wide. And they just keep going. Yeah. And and so today I, I, I want to kind of I want to kind of put them in a little bit of an order, at least that I have in my head, because I told you earlier in the green room that I've been having a, a discussion with my daughter mm. and she's having these discussions at school. And it's really cool because. I start having these conversations and talking about these things and she's riveted and yeah. she's like really like, whoa, and, and it's not the words I'm saying, it's what the words have in them. And that's what I'm sensing. It's like, hold on, this is, this is complete versus, you know, that's that is what it feels like to me and, and for her. And, and we're just getting started there, too. So it's just cool to have, you know, not everybody has their daughter being interested in spiritual discussions like this. So it's really cool. And you're giving me some ammo. So, go. but we got some cool people in here. Mike Ostell's number one, man. That's a good Yo. sign. Way one more, go, Mike. <laughs> What's hey, up, dude? Mike? Hey, dude. Welcome back, dude. One more opportunity to spend time with friends and Jesus bless this time, Lord. You know, it is so cool, Mike, that you, you know, are here, one. Um, but two, just to, you know, live life. 
I don't know if I told you, Steve, but I did, you know, fundraising consulting for churches for a while. And I met a guy out of uh, Vista Church. His name was uh, Larry Osborne. And he said to me, well, I was asking him, I said, How, why is it that you have so many people? They had like 95% of all their people were in, in sermon-based small groups. And everyone would come to him and ask him, well, how do you get so many people in these small group experiences? And he laughed. And he was one of these contrarian guys. He goes, Matt, it's not about the content. I was like, what? He goes, no, 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 no. That's just an excuse to get together. Because if you can get people together for about six weeks, he said, you know, shit's going to hit the fan. <laughs> this is what he said to me. And I'm like, the pastor just said the shit's going to hit the fan. And he said, and people will care for each other. Yeah. And that's what galvanizes them together. He's like, this isn't some, and he understood that yeah. it wasn't like, oh, well, because we're teaching from the Bible. No. And he didn't, he didn't lie about it either. He's just like, no, I know that if I can get people to get together for a period of time, somebody has a problem yeah, and someone, and that's an opportunity for you to serve them. And so in a way, Mike, you know, you've had a problem and challenges and all that stuff. And it's a privilege. It's an honor to bear that burden with you and to walk alongside you because that's real life. Well, his uh, and his partner, Peggy, is an example of that kind of partnership. You know, there we all end up in situations where things are a little are a little tough and we need a little help. And uh, back to that proaction thing you were talking about earlier, yeah. you know. The whole stage was set long ago for Mike to have a partner to help him work through it on the ground, and we see the results of it. Yeah. One more opportunity to spend time with my friends in Jesus. Bless this time, Lord. That says it all. Yeah. Well, and you know what's interesting is, you know, you stop for a second, and when you're in that situation, I can imagine having open heart surgery and challenge of you know rehabilitation, if you will, is it really sets your perspective. I mean, yeah. you kind of have to go to the base layer and go, okay, I'm really thankful that I do have people around me. And, you know, we're so caught up in so many things that are trivial and don't mean or matter. And then you have something like this serious happen and you go, you know what? It, you take stock and you're reminded of the core value of, you know, creation and partnership and friendship and love and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, very cool, Mike. Thanks for being here. David Lee is here. Um, we just made our day. Made our day. Isn't that the truth? Thanks, my faithful <laughs> friends. Uh, everywhere I look, there's David Lee. Hey, <laughs> David Lee's one of those guys. He'll sneak up on you and give you a hug. You got to be careful when you're when you're with him. Uh, David Lee, good to see you. Hexonium's here. Magnus is here. Sam Kemp's here. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you. Compassion or crypto compassion? What's up, man? Um, Hexonium's got the popcorn ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, uh that's so awesome at jesus you're welcome that's so awesome hexonium thanks for that um good friday too absolutely i love seeing people engaging in the chat um tank crypto if it wasn't for tank crypto i wouldn't have met you you know that yeah, i do know that that's so cool that. yeah. it's so cool yeah. so thanks tank yeah he was part of the win that day <laughs> yes part of the win part of the win so let's let's kick this thing off here steve with the thing that was really the first mind blower of like 30,000 different times my head was exploding over thinking differently about, you know, what is this experience in the present engaging with Jesus himself? And, you know, the, the theme of this, this whole stream is upside down, right side up. And so we, we talked about that, but I read some stuff that you had talked about and we had started engaging a conversation and what came out of that was Jesus is alive and he speaks. That was like the cut, the everything kind of came back to that because you kept saying to me, why don't you ask him yourself? Cause I was challenged with certain thoughts and I'm like, and instead of you like quoting Bible verses and saying, go look at this and I'm right and you're wrong. You just said, Hey, this is the way it works. He is alive and he speaks. So why don't you talk to him? Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Because you said it's hard to have a relationship with somebody you don't talk to. I think that's like so fundamentally true. Well, well, it is. I mean, and it. Um, I mean, think about again, just getting to the place where you just pause and say, "Okay, well, what does this mean? What are the implications?" and Am I even willing to consider those implications? 
because there's a tremendous amount of courage that's required to step out of what you are told is the truth to actually be willing to examine if it is the truth. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that is no small thing. And so what's one of the shame that um, shames that happen um, inside the religious structure is it asks you to make a total investment into an idea that you then bank your eternity on. <laughs> well, to any reasoning purpose, that that is a heck of an equation. Yeah. Because if something is wrong in the factors of the equation, man, I'm screwed. So there is this, once you settle on what you are willing to accept as true, what you don't realize is a part of that is that there are all kinds of defensive barriers built around that concept that you call true. And there's neither an exit, nor is there a door to enter. You are locked in. And so even the consideration of, hmm, I think I'm gonna, man, am I really willing to put this to the test? Um, Man, that's a big deal, um, especially for somebody who may not be particularly searching for that at the moment. Um, and so this this idea that um, that we assign the ultimate creator at, with this word, three letter word in English called God. We don't really pause to think about what that means if you are truly the supreme being. And so if you're the supreme being and you've gone through this exercise of creating, are you going to create and then remove you from the thing you created? Well, do any of us do that? No. Nope. No, I mean, you know, if I want a table, you know, I build the table and I sit at the table. You know, if I, and you just go right down, right down the list. And if I can't build something, I buy it from somebody. Now exchange of labor, right? I buy it from somebody so that I can, I can use it. it I can interact with it. I, I don't ask a girl on the date, on a date and then have her, take her to a restaurant and then go to another restaurant myself. I don't do those things, right? I interact with the thing that I'm choosing to be in relationship with. And so if this God gave us the ability to, to possess certain capabilities, motion, sight, thought, reasoning, uh, communication, uh, I think I said mobility, all these various things, uh, procreation, uh, all of this relationship, all of these things, then why would he remove himself from those with the very ones he created? Now, that's a really big question when you get right down to it. Because then it says, hmm, now you don't have the answer to that. You can form one. You can create one. You can even declare that your answer is the truth. But that's simply self-construction at that point. You have constructed a concept on your own. It's much different to then say, okay, boss, what about that? I can speak, so does that mean you can speak? Hmm. If I can hear, does that mean you can hear? And can I speak and can I hear because you speak and you hear? OMG, where is that now going to take me? It seems so obvious when you say it, Steve. It seems so obvious. 
you know, it's 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 really odd, actually. It's almost like we've picked up in the middle. <laughs> we we have. Have. That's how it feels. It's almost like, well, because daddy was a Quaker, you're a Quaker. You know, it's like, well, because that's why we picked up in the middle of this is like, well, hang on a second. What if I'm concerned about these core questions? And that's something that is really rejected, too, within the church is like, stop asking these questions. Right. Yeah. We just go along with this program. And how cool is it, though? Because this really goes into the next big topic, which is interest, right? Yeah. You first are like, hey, it takes a lot of courage to have this conversation. If you're one that's going to speak and listen and we're, we're similar and you're at the table, do you have interest? And I love that because it's not a formula. Yeah. Yeah. It's a desire. Well, and it's one that you cannot construct. It is either there or it isn't there. You know, we've all been around people who uh, kind of feign interest. You know, they, yeah, yeah. you know, they kind of pretend like they're interested. Um, so we know what it looks like to. We know what artificial interest looks like. Um, it's fake. It's disin disingenuous. It it has, even though the other person may be trying to be polite and considerate, and let's ass let's assign to them the most noble of intentions in being interested. If they're not interested, there's nothing they can do to make that happen. So that's one of the, one of the profound parts of this that really makes it simple um, in talking with other folks about it in particular is are they interested? Why? because you've experienced that for yourself. Am I interested? Okay, God, if I ask you this, am I really interested in your answer? Or would I just prefer to believe what I believe and call it good? Well, you know, that's a real question. Yeah. And so you're able to recognize what legitimate interest is and the power it possesses because you yourself have gone through it. If you haven't, then you don't know what that means um, insofar as it relates, you know, to, to matters of, of God and the kingdom. Um, but you have it in other areas. You're interested in a career. You're interested, you know, in a mate. You're interested in money or you're interested in possessions or you're interested in the well-being of others. I mean, we all know what interest looks like, see, and in no, and not, and in not one instance is that a manufactured, you know, intention or attitude. It's That's authentic right. as it becomes. Yeah. And it's really inter interesting, right? Like literally, yeah. you know, this idea of it's very binary because you know you talked about probing things for for what's real and what's not. You made a really good point that I want to emphasize, and that is you can really quickly see if this is true or not, meaning it's, it's really binary because in some respects you're saying, well, if you're a God who speaks and hears and I, I'm going to try and for size because I'm interested, are you really who you say you are? Yeah. And rather than talking to someone about what their experience is, and of course the Bible is that in its, in a nutshell, right? We're, we're reading about other people's direct experience or secondhand experience with the power of God in the world. Yes. These are, these are accounts of that. And so, you, you know, some people like that, right? They're like, well, I like the historical study of understanding what has happened in the past. And that gives me some, you know, that's some additional data and information. I just feel like what's been left out is what you're talking about is saying, if there's a guy who created this whole thing and gave us these attributes, and I'm going to make an assumption that he can speak in here because it's littered through the historical documents. What if I tried him out myself? And that's what you said to me at the very beginning. You're like, why don't you ask him yourself? And now we've had many conversations that I don't hear like, Matt, here are the lottery numbers. <laughs> but you know what's amazing is it's it's in a way like the wind for a reason. Yeah. Because if it was a directive, we wouldn't need to have choice. We wouldn't have to make a distinction between lookalikes. Well, what's fascinating is that, again, we don't, we are not trained 
to distinguish between lookalikes. When it, particularly when it comes from a spiritual point of view. We're simply not trained that way. Now, if you wanted to spend 30 minutes, we could talk about why that, you know, why that is so. But we're just not trained that way. And so what we're trained to do is to be told what the truth is, and then we have a choice to accept it or reject it. Well, the that isn't how it works. See, because the what if we are trained, if we have been trained our whole lives to think one thing, and that one thing is wrong, then guess how we are going to hear virtually everything related to that to that thing? We're going to hear it wrong. Yeah, yeah. And even though it's precisely true what we're told, we're going to interpret that from the perversion of how we have been trained. So what you learn uh, about this speaking God, this speaking Jesus, is that when you ask a question, he immediately is moving in response to your question. He is, he is attentive to it, and he's answering it. And the first part of his answer is to start ridding you of all the stuff that will cause you to hear his answer in a perverse manner. That may take a day, that may take a week, that may take a month. In some instances, it's taken me 10 years. In other instances, it's taking me nearly 30 years. In other instances, it's taking me 15 seconds. Or instantly when he says it, it's there. I don't have control over those. He does. But what he's doing is faithfully working to rid me of all of the perspectives that would pervert the very truth that I'm asking him to speak to me. So he's answering me right away. Well, if you don't know that, then you think he's not answering you. But if you do know it, guess what? You know you're in for a, for a heck of a ride. And so just one day, you'll just wake up and boom, there, there it'll be. And after you experience that about 150 times, you start thinking, oh, wow, maybe there's something to this. You know, and so you start cooperating with it as opposed to assigning to him that he doesn't speak and he's not speaking. No, nah. yeah. when you ask, he's answering instantly. Call to me and yeah. I will be attentive to every inquiry. And I will set before you, right in front of you, things that you did not know, things that you did not even consider. Wow. That's the guy I want to hang with. You know, what's amazing, too, is I think it's helpful for me because I was, you know, as I was walking through this with you, also, I was trying to understand what does speak really mean? Yeah. And one of the things you said, and I thought is a great analogy, is when you bring a baby home. And this is one of the first things we talked about. You asked me the question, you know, when you brought your daughter home, first child, and I was like, I don't know if that we should be allowed to take this child home. And I was super careful, right? And I remember looking in the back seat and seeing this little tiny baby in this big car seat. And of course, now she's, you know, senior in high school. And, you know, what's amazing about it is you said, well, did she speak English when she came, when you took her home from the hospital? And then I thought about, you know, very recently, you know, if you've ever had an experience with, let's say your wife, and it could be in a tragic situation or in a joyful situation where there was communication that had no words. Right on. And it had a feeling and a sense. And, you know, that's the thing that I think is important for us to, to, to communicate is the term speaks. Jesus is alive and he speaks. Doesn't mean Jesus is alive and he only yells. Yeah. Right. So, so can you help kind of flesh that out? What does him speaking look like? Well, the first thing um, that I would offer in that is, is recognizing that speaking is a form of communicating. 
And so Jesus is a master communicator. So whatever it is that is necessary to convey the message in the communication, that's the mechanism he'll use. And we know that true, going back to our those of us who have children. Um, some of the most powerful ways that I speak is just by looking. Well, have you ever had Jesus just look at you? Uh, yeah, man. And when he looks at you, there will be 10,000 words that will form in your mind that are interpreting that look, which is the mechanism he has chosen to speak. Um, sometimes just a feeling, as you're, as you're mentioning. So all of these things that we know and experience in our relationships, why do we have those? Because we're created in his image. We have those capabilities that he possesses. And so this speaking comes in a, in a myriad of ways um, with the intention of communicating what is in his mind and heart and thoughts and emotions to convey to us so we have those same thoughts, emotions, and feelings and intentions that he has. And the, the key in it all is being open enough to move beyond just verbal communication with words, which he does, to communicating as a more macro kind of um, intention to convey what is in his mind so it becomes in our mind in the same manner. Wow. Um, it, that makes me think about... Um, you know, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes. In this Romans 12, you know, it's that's such a powerful thought here is that, well, what am I doing right now with you, right? Okay, so what you said to me, and that, that whole list is, hey, there's a way that the world is. Don't conform to that because it's upside down. Yes. Okay, how do I renew my mind? Well, I renew my mind by speaking with you, well, how does Jesus speak? And you just said, in so many ways. You know, I told you the other day, I said, I knew from the moment I heard that yeah. it was not right. Yeah. I had discernment. I knew it wasn't the right direction. I knew that this person was actually lying. I had this discernment. That wasn't Jesus saying, that guy's lying. It was, but that's the net effect of it. Yes. But this yeah. cool, this thing is, what you're basically saying, I think I'm seeing you know, this verse that I memorized long ago of Romans 12, uh, 2 is what does it really mean to renew your mind? Well, what is Jesus doing? He's reforming your understanding. And this idea of being re right side up is you go, there's real tangible benefits with aligning yourself with the actual time order and rank of creation. And this idea of, well, how do I renew my mind? Well, I talk to him. And yeah. it's so powerful of an idea in its simplicity to say, and I love it. This is the first time you've said to me, well, if we have the ability to speak in here, it kind of would make sense that he does too. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's so, it's so dumb to say, but so simple and so true. And it's yeah. interesting that this is not where we start generally with. We, we start almost in reverence, which, you know, I appreciate it. But I yeah. feel like the introduction that we make to God, and I think about the cathedral, right? What is it a picture of? It's a picture of how small you are in relation, which is, I, I would say, is true, right? The, the, the grandness, the amazing of who God is. But what it does is it, it completely puts you in this position where, are you approachable? Can I actually talk to you? And it's almost like in reverence, we're kept far from the person, and I think I mentioned this a while back. Um, it was uh, Jordan Peterson who said, you know, gaze upon him. And he was talking about, in the context of the, the Catholic Church, them having him up on the cross. And he said, he is the sum of all fears. Yeah. And he said, you know, in psychology, why would I want to gaze upon this man? And he said, everything that he experienced, 
right? He experienced all of this and he is the sum of all things that are plaguing you and that he is a friend of those things. And it's, it becomes so approachable in that respect that his experience here is a model for what we go through. And, you know, all of these statements, like, um, I do nothing um, apart from the Father, right? I only do what he tells me to do. Man does not live on bread alone, but out of every word that comes out of the mouth of God. There's so many examples of this. This is my son. Listen to him. The Spirit of God saying, "I will." He will remind you of everything I said, and it's such. I've mentioned to you many times. It's not like, oh, it's one hundred and eighty for me. It's a click going. Oh, yeah. The thing that the, the the spirits are trying to do is trying to keep me from having this dialogue and this relationship. Because if I'm rightly related and my mind is renewed, hold on a second, the effectiveness quotient goes through the roof. Well, absolutely. I mean, and, and that kind of connects to some of our, you know, off stream things, you know, like, like um, some of the projects that, you know, that Jesus is having you um, be directly involved with. Uh, we talked about Carter, you yep. know, and some of the things that Jesus has with him. There's another gentleman named Rob, who's the same. There's all there's a lot of us out there. Um, and you've heard me share that, you know, there are 10,000 business people out there that have been primed and ready to go. And so this thing is right at the tipping point. Um, well, what is, you know, what is happening with everybody? Why are we getting to that place of readiness? Um, well, it's because we have dared at whatever level that we operate in, we've dared to say, Jesus, we actually want you to be the man. We actually want to do what you're doing. We actually want to be a part of what you're doing. That's what we want to do. And just that simple level of interest begins to change you from the inside out because whether we recognize Jesus talking to us or not, he is talking to us constantly, and when he is, he's creating in us the ability to perform our role with him that was assigned to us before time began. That's what he's doing. And there is a convergence that's getting ready to occur that is going to take this upside down world and turn it right back up, right side up. That's what's going to happen. And in the meantime, the right side up world is going to start atrophying and disintegrating, which it's already doing. It's happening right in front of our eyes. We just don't know what to do with it. You know, we don't know how to describe it. It may instill some fear. But the reality is that thing is turning, you know, to the it's decaying and turning to the rot that is in the core of its essence. So, OK, that was me. I was decaying from the inside out. And what happened? Hey, I'm kind of interested in what you're doing. You are? Well, follow me. Cool. How do I follow you? Just be interested, Steve. I'll take it from there. I'll show you how to do it. How accessible is that, Steve? Yeah. You know, and that's that's what's so refreshing to me. It's so refreshing. It's just this idea of, hey, and, and you know what also is the case is I think a lot of times I've kind of created in my mind this judge, right? Yeah. You know, kind of a, a, a mean spirited father, if you will. And of course, I think that, you know, comes sometimes from people's experience in life with with dads and, and fathers in general. But I was thinking about, you know, if there's one who created all of this and knows all of it and prepared all of these things and is outside of time. Do you think there's anything that you may do or think, whether it's aligned or not aligned, that it surprises him? No. Yeah. And I think about how much I, I think about my kids, and I'm like, my son, he got his first 100% on his science. And I'm going to tell you what, this was a Herculean effort for him. <laughs> 
and he he's like dad there's no way i'm i'm basically destined for c's and maybe low b's i'm like son not around here you're not <laughs> i said i will always have high expectations of you because i know you're capable and you know we had to think of different ways and in, in mechanisms if you will to study that it, it could help him but just how proud he was to know that he could do it yeah. but he had to do it you know no one could do it for him and i think about well i went through the same thing right i'm aware of that and just as a human dad i know that i know that the father sees it the same way yeah is that nothing is a surprise and that brings me to that the next big topic which was what blew my mind and i'm going to go through all of these like mind blowing things in this stream is you you said to me you said um hey in the in the garden in the beginning you said was was god surprised that satan showed up in the form of a serpent and that really like put me back on my heels and i think i was taught that it was these decisions we ruined everything yeah. right that it was a surprise to him and a mistake that the serpent was actually there this is a big big concept for a lot of people to understand and for me it was significant. Can you talk about that again, about the significance of this fact that I think we're programmed to think that, oh, we screwed everything up and this was not the plan. But when you understand that it actually was a part of the plan, it all becomes clear. Yeah, we call, we call God the supreme being, but we won't attribute to him what the attributes of a supreme being are. So let me see if I get this right. <clears throat> you have, you are all knowing, you are all present, you are all power powerful, and yet I slipped you a Mickey and you didn't know it. Well, how does that work? See? Well, if you're all knowing, then what does it be, mean to be all knowing? Right. See, and and so when the serpent showed up and and Satan did whatever he did with that serpent to get the serpent to align with him. God, did you have any idea that was going on? Did that? And now we're back to, did that catch you by surprise? Well, Steve, if it did, then what would that say about me? He didn't, he, he does this so often. He, he doesn't give you a direct answer. He allows your very question to be the answer in itself. And we're not taught to think like that. I don't think anyone in, in theological seminaries are taught to think that way. I, I think if you had this very basic thing, you know, how many people would actually say, no, this was all a part of the plan? I mean, it forces you. It's such a pivotal decision point. Like you have to go, well, you're saying he's all powerful. You're saying he's all knowing. Well, that's exactly right. And so what's, what is absolutely fascinating uh, about God is that he he knows who he is. And so he is he is not um, insecure about anything that we may attribute to him or declare that he is against or what he must do. it it has virtually no, impact on him because he is what is true. And so when you think about the issue in the garden and you go, well, wow, man, okay, what would that say about you if that caught you off guard or by surprise? It would say that somebody else was more shrewd than you are. It would say that maybe you aren't all-knowing. It would say 
that I have or something else has the ability to screw up your plan. Well, if those are true, then why am I even messing with you? Because you're not, you know, you're not no different than I am. Because those, you're that's explaining my attributes. Yeah. See, so <laughs> if I'm explaining my attributes, then what the heck am I looking to me for? Ah, now we're back to the Gen Con with the high places. Yeah, we have constructed on the highest places in our environment an altar and built a God there that we look up to. Yep, we're looking up for sure, but we're still earthbound and we're looking up to that very thing that we've constructed and expecting it to do more for me than what I can do for myself. Now, if that's not upside down, I don't know what is. So when we go back to, you know, in the garden, well, man, if you knew, if this didn't catch you by surprise and you are, then what the heck was going on there? What actually was happening? If you knew that Satan was going to solicit and engage the serpent, man, I'd really like to know what that transaction looked like. What the heck was going on there? And then the serpent was the agent of Satan who then approached the woman and would just start talking to her like it was an everyday occurrence and she didn't seem the least bit concerned that some animal let alone a, you know, a creepy one, was talking to her like an everyday conversation. What the heck was going on? All of a sudden, the garden story starts to explode in all kinds of, um, I don't want to call them notions, but ideas and concepts that are happening at every stage that each one uh, in and of themselves is just mind blowing. Well, the implication, you know, and I think for folks who are, you know, just know the general story, right? If, if you say, okay, try this on for size, God knew exactly what he was doing when he allowed Satan to use the serpent. And, you know, what was that? And, and that leads us to this transaction that happened between the serpent and Eve. And that, to me, like it's a natural progression into this big idea of authority. Can you describe that interaction and what that really means? Because this whole idea of they kicked us out and put flame and swords for a reason, there's a really, really big concept there that just literally exploded my brain. Yeah, sure. And, you know, we're, uh, we're taught to be thinking in terms of God allowing things, uh, that that is such a false concept in our, you know, in the way that we think. That's reducing the way God views something in the way that we view something. Okay, if this is an anomaly inside, then God must have said, oh, let's see what's going on there. Yeah, I think I'll allow that. No, that's a reactive posture with the event. No, this thing was designed to allow for the full expression of choice. Okay. And so within the full expression of choice, choice is a fundamental component to infinity. You remove choice, you don't have infinity any longer. And so choice is, is that fundamental component of infinity that provides for infinite choice and opportunity, which God is fully, fully happy not only to... Um, incorporate into his, the design of his creation, but is fundamental to the design of his creation. Being able to deal with that infinite expression is one of the things that distinguishes him from the creatures he's created. See? It overwhelms us. It's just, a, it's just a normal part of the way he's designed things to function. So when you have this choice between um, what did what did Satan do as the covering chair? He exercised a choice to use what God had given him as a means of advancing his own interests. 
That's the choice he made. What was the choice? He, what was another choice? His choice was not to confront Adam and Eve, the Elohim, in the garden because they were superior beings. So what did he do? He engaged and solicited a partner, the serpent. However, that happened. Why? So that if the Elohim man or woman caught on to the scheme, the serpent would be the casualty, not Satan. See, the agent. Now all of a sudden you start understanding the nature of darkness. The nature of darkness is not to directly confront the nature of a superior being. The nature of darkness is to confront through agency. So that if the, something goes awry, it's the agent that becomes the casualty, not the um, director, if you will, of, um, of the agent, in this case, Satan. So now the serpent approaches Eve. In that exchange, you see that Eve was being challenged by, confronted with a problem in the administration of the garden in the execution of her responsibilities with her husband to till and manage, you know, in this particular instance, the garden in as a preface to training them to administer the entire planet. And so she was troubled about something. How do you know that? Because she was seeking wisdom. She was seeking something. Okay? If you're not seeking something, there's no opportunity to come after you. You know, some somebody could tempt me all day long to shoot heroin and they could offer me the entire planet and I'm not interested. I'm not seeking that. It's not something I desire. It has no place in my being of interest. So there has to be an area of interest before there can be an approach um, of anything. So in this case, it would be the approach of the serpent to provide a solution. And what the serpent did is the serpent, then through the mechanism of transaction, offered Eve, what she already had in exchange for what she literally had. So how does it, what, did, what do you mean by that? The first thing we have to recognize is that if Satan was as powerful as we say that he is, he would have just walked in the garden and said, I'm taking over. I'm the man. I'm the covering cherub. I am the chief of all angelic beings. I am the first. When wisdom create was created, I was created with wisdom. And I'm taken over. You now bow to me. Well, Satan didn't do that. Well, why didn't he do that? Because he's not who he says he is. He is an angelic being. He's not a ruling being. And so for an angelic being to obtain the ability and authority to rule, it has to receive that from one who does have the authority to rule. Ah, enter Eve. Now, isn't it fascinating that he didn't go to Adam first? Yes. He went to Eve first. Why? Because Eve was a subordinate authority just as the serpent was a subordinate authority to Eve. You see the stair-stepping yep. that, that Satan does? That's the way darkness works. Darkness does not directly confront. It, it confronts through agency, through other mechanisms. So that if you find out who it is, then, then they're not the casualty. The casualty is, again, as I've said now a third time, the agent. So what... The serpent was after was to achieve the mission it was given, which was to secure the authority, the ruling class authority that Eve possessed through the mechanism of transaction. Power was not, force was not the mechanism. It had to be voluntarily handed over. That's the nature of authority. Okay. 
So what the what the serpent did is the serpent engaged in a transaction. Oh, you got a problem, Eve? Huh? Is that what it is? Yeah. What did what happened here? Yeah. Didn't 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 Jehovah say that you could eat of any tree of the garden? So why aren't you doing that? I see where you got a problem. What's what's the problem? Really? Let me see if I can figure out. And maybe I can help you. Well, yeah, he said that we could eat of virtually everything except for that tree in the middle of the garden. We can't, we can't eat that, man. We can't even touch that thing, nor can we even strike it. See, we, we have no ability to even judge that thing. We, we have to keep our distance. Nah. Yep. Yep. If we do, man, we're going to die. I find it fascinating that the serpent didn't say, well, what does it mean to die, Eve? Yeah. Do you even know what it means to, to die? She couldn't have known. That? See? It's a concept that had no meaning to her. See? We, talk, we talked about it in the past is the filament. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to filament. Well, what's a filament? Well, I don't know. Doesn't sound too, too terrible to me. I don't even know what a filament is. No, you're not going to fill them. You're not going to die. For in the day you eat it, what happens is now there is a slandering of the of the nature and character of Jehovah. For he knows in the day you eat it, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. Well, what did Eve know at that point? Good. She knew good. She didn't know evil. Now, What's fascinating about this is that once you consider the, the errant concept that this was a surprise to God and we screwed up his plan, you never get to the fundamental purpose for the entire garden experience and then how that then translates to us in our everyday lives, because we're living the garden experience every single day. And that is, which is not on your list, um, which I'd, I would encourage you to, you know, to put on there, is the whole reason why God created to begin with. That his man, his Adam, would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. That was his vision. That is his vision. And so in order to rule, we have to be able to distinguish between good and evil, which means we have to know the difference between good and evil. Eve had no clue what evil was. She only knew what good was. And so to consider that this was an accident misses the very point that this was the first engagement of God's man dealing with an intruder whose intentions were evil. And she didn't know it. So let me ask you this. Is what you're saying, and this is the thing that blew my mind, is what you're saying is it was Jehovah's intent all along. I got rain coming down, if you can hear it there. If it was his intent all along, that they would know good and evil because that's what made them rulers. It's what enabled them to rule. They were already rulers. rulers. Okay, I got you. So it, what you're it saying is enabled it, them to rule. So in order to rule and to be made like him, because this idea of choice, yeah. I mean, they had choices prior to this event, this transaction, but they were limited from this one that gave them the knowledge of good and evil. And so I think what's, what's really flies in the face of probably 99% of people's, you know, teaching in this area is the idea. And you're making, you're breaking it down so clearly that, hold on, let's use logic here. If God is, is all knowing and all powerful and all these things, and he's not surprised by this, then this was his plan all along. Yeah. And to think that, well, why would I need my man to know good and evil? And what's your answer to that? So that, so that he is, so, so that he would be equipped to rule. 
But again, very, very simple. Okay. Um, your son is the youngest in the family. Yeah. Right? Was he 10, 12? Yeah, 12. Okay, he's 12. Um, are you handing over the, the reins to him to rule the family? Nope. Why not? He's 12. He's 12. <laughs> See? He, he is just now getting introduced into things that are, wow, maybe not exactly right. And he's starting to calculate what these now, you described that in the form of, oh, I can't do well on this test. Well, what yep. did dad do? Dad came along and said, no, 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 no. Let me show you how, how this works. Yeah, that's exactly see, right. See, this, well, I'm going to use for sake of illustration, the, this thing that is telling you that you're not capable, that's evil. That is contrary to the way that you have been designed to function. And you can overcome that. You can deal with that appropriately by learning how to access not only your personal capabilities, but then things that are outside you to help you. Now, right now you're looking at mechanisms, but eventually you'll say, hey, listen, there is one that you can access who will help you in every single one of these. And he's the guy that built it all. He's yeah. a pretty good con consultant. It's he knows how better. it works. He's better than chat GPT, son. That's right. <laughs> right? Wow. See, so well, why do you do it? Because he's not equipped. Wow. He's not equipped to rule yet. And what does he lack? He lacks experience. He lacks the, the acknowledgement of what is, what is good and what is evil. You know, what is right and what is wrong, what is appropriate, what's inappropriate. He's lived, lived under the shelter of goodness of the family. But eventually your job is to equip him to where he can then step outside the family and then deal with the outside world that possesses good and evil, beginning with ruling his own life. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you this question. It just kind of dawned on me. You know, I think about the beginning, in the beginning, and what we have as an, as a, an account of creation, the beginning. Yeah. And it's interesting because it just kind of dawned on me this idea of separating things. Yeah. Okay. And I think what's really interesting about what you just said, and maybe I'm just having a bit of an aha myself, is light from dark, right? Yeah. Land from sea, you know, these things of separating things. Yeah. Well, they exist together, but separate, right? Yes. The light and the dark, they exist, but they exist separately. And he was the one that created and separated those things. And it's interesting to me that there was this form of goodness that, in a way, as a function of creation, that separated. You now are going to learn, son, the difference between good and evil. To this point, yes. you've known good. Now you're going to know evil because in order to rule in my nature and character with the choice I'm giving you, which is like me, you will do this. Now, what's amazing is this leads to the big, big, big idea, which is if we are sons of the Most High God, right, we are truly grafted into the family, then who does he say we are? And yeah. what's amazing about that is I asked my daughter this the other day. I said, you know, who's more powerful, us or the angels? And everyone you asked, are like, well, those angels, they're really powerful. And this is the upside down world. But what blew my mind again with this progression is the fact that this idea that, that what is in us, who we are, the spark of the Spirit of God, who we are in Him is the ruling class. And the ruling yeah. class is defined as the Elohim. Yes. And this idea that we can do nothing separate from Him means that we are an extension of Him. And of course, all these stories of birthrights and having, um, you know, this being an heir, right? And yeah. having some sort of um, status within a family is so clearly illustrated here. And I think so many of us have been told and deceived that you are lesser than the angels and lesser than the animals, or you're just an animal. And I think it's such a powerful idea is that when you dove into, and I don't know that we have time to go into the specific detail of the scriptures on this, but that's such a powerful idea is when you realize who you are in him, it changes the whole thing. It's like, wow, so there is real purpose to, to this thing. 
if yeah, I understand yeah. that I'm actually an extension of him and I am Elohim man. That's one of the things I had the hardest time understanding. But when I got it, I was like, wow, that's why Jesus said we would rule over the angels. He, yes. This was all been ordered correctly. It's just I was taught incorrectly. Yes, that is exactly right. Yeah, Matt, I mean, so you ask these questions, um, like with even the serpent, part of my answer for, in particular, the, the audience is look at how many places you can go with just the consideration that the serpent wasn't a surprise yeah. to God and that I didn't screw up his plan. Once I remove those errant thoughts, now it opens up an entire world of consideration over every little detail that carries with it some profound implications through the revealing of things that are very, very simple. And one of them is, well, if I didn't screw this up, then, huh, and this was part of your plan to teach me you know, the difference between good and evil in, in, a, in the most basic fundamental way, because all I knew before was good. I had no concept of what was evil. I was told not what not to do, but I didn't mean anything to me. Yeah. You know, um, I could either exercise a choice to do it or not do it. But in terms of the consequence, I had no idea. I didn't even know what that meant. See, I wasn't developed yet enough to know that. Well, then you go, well, why is that? Well, what is it that I assign man to do? Now, I'm talking about the gender man. I'm talking about the class of being called the Adam in Hebrew and the Anthropos in, in Greek and human in English. Okay. Um, well, what did I what did I assign my man to do? Well, I assign, oh, I don't know. Well, you told me to, to rule. You said your man was to, wow, exercise dominion. To rule and subdue. Well, who am I supposed to rule over and what am I supposed to subdue? And when will I know how to do that? And against whom am I to, do, to rule? What, what is the difference between exercising dominion and ruling? What, what are all of these things you're telling me I'm supposed to do? I don't even know what they are. Well, let's begin by having all of the creatures that I've created come in front of you and then you get to name every one of them. And I'm gonna sit back and watch and see what you do. I'm gonna watch and see what you name every single one of those. Well, why are you going to do that, Jehovah? Because did I not say that you are to rule the entirety of the earth? Well, yes. Well, how can you rule if they are not first subjected to you? Well, I don't, I don't know. Well, how do you subject them to me? By you naming them. When you name them, you become superior to the thing that you name. The thing that is named is subordinate to the one who names. Isn't that exactly what happens in your family, Steve? Well, what does that mean? Well, that's what happens when you rule. That is part of the responsibility of rulership. Steve, when you and your wife had your children, who named them? You know, did your pastor name them? Did your parents name them? Did your sister or brother name them? Did your neighbor? Did you call some stranger on the, you know, on the line and say, hey, listen, man, I'm, I'm stuck. What, what am I supposed to call my? No, you named them. And when you named them, who had authority over them? And then who was subordinate to you? Were you subordinate to your child or was your child subordinate to you? 
Well, they were subordinate to me. Until when, Steve? Oh, man, now, you, now it's a trick question. Until you give your authority to them. And when you give your authority to them and you become subordinate to them, do you have a right side up house or an upside down house? Why don't you give your authority to them? Because they're not equipped. You see where I'm going with all of this? We live this every single day, everywhere. Oh my goodness. This is humongous. Steve, are you sure you didn't play softball? Because you are just <laughs> setting them right up. You know what's amazing is this idea of naming rights. And so we talked about this, and this is such a great review, and it's so wonderful, Steve, because it's like it's it's getting in order here in a neat sort of way. So this idea of naming rights, and you're absolutely right. It's interesting because we adopted a son, right? And my son, we named him. He got a new name yeah, and he took our name that we gave him and he is under our authority. And it's interesting. I was thinking about in marriage, what are, what do we do? Well, the father gives away his daughter and you think yes. about authority and names and in our culture, she takes another's name and the father gives her away. Well, what is he doing? He's giving her unto the authority of her husband. And it's really amazing, actually. I just kind of thought through that. It's like, well, names do matter. And it's amazing, actually, what names mean. And, and actually, the attributes of the name themselves and what they, people become under those names. It's amazing. Yes. Um, how wonderful is that? But it, it, it creates... See, this is the thing that I think is so helpful about all this, and I hope people are picking up from this, is that the truth can be probed and probed and probed and probed and it still remains true. Yes. And I think what's happened is you start acting, you know, asking these questions, you go, okay, now I get it. So this training ground, if you will, well, I let you name them so that they would be subordinate to you. Yes. And what an amazing thing. You know, I think it gets overlooked so much. Oh yeah, it's cutie name the animals. That's nice. No, 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 no. Do you understand what it means to name yeah. And this is this is really big. And Steve, I attribute this to your professional interest and attitude as it relates to the things of God, right? To ask him and to think that your professional attitude of interest and continuing to go, hey, what do you mean by this? Is just like you going, well, how do you hit the curveball? Yeah. How do you yeah. hit it? Well, you got to think differently. If you're going to hit the curveball, you got to know how the game works. Yes. And you know what's funny is now when I read the scriptures, you know, I read stuff since I've gotten to know you and learn these things, and I'm amazed how many things I missed that were just telling me how it works. Yes. They were revealing the structure. Like, hey, here's the structure of how it works. Oh, so you keep on telling me the same story and over and over again to understand the main story. You know, I, I, and of course, I, yeah, I'll insert this here, is everyone, I think, knows the prodigal son story, where the son leaves. He wants his you know, inheritance now. I want an Oompa Loompa now. And it's like, <laughs> okay. And to think when all that was said and done, that a father who has a nature and character, you only end up learning it through the process of your destruction. And then people ask this big question. It's the most common atheist question. Well, how does a good God allow these bad things to happen? And I just, it just becomes so clear to me that in this process of this life in training you to understand how to rule and reign, it would make sense that this life is kind of like boot camp. We're yeah. learning how to make choices and to rule and reign in his nature and character. And what is the? how does it manifest itself? Well, we bless and we protect. We yes. don't extract and destroy. That's exactly right. And what's amazing is this working out of our faith, and I almost see like this contradiction of, you know, what people say salvation is and what basically the Bible says about salvation. is like, I'm kind of working this thing out. Well, hi, because you're learning. You're yeah. learning this stuff. You're like, well, how do I know I've learned it all? Well, are you ruling and reigning in my nature and character? And to think that he told us the very reason that he created. I mean, Jesus told us what the, I mean, almost like put it into a pithy statement in how he taught us to pray. Yeah. Yes. And so if you said, so would you just say it again? Because it's just so good to hear. Why did God create in the first place? 
so that as man would rule his creation with him. Think about that. So his man, the Adam, Anthropos, human, Us. both male and female, you and I, everybody on the stream, uh, that we would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. That's it. Hallelujah. Now, once you, once that res, you know, registers, it completely reshapes your attitude, the way you think, the way you conduct your life, the way you relate to others, how you exercise authority. Now, this is not something that happens in 15 seconds after you have your aha. It just <laughs> means that the aha has legs to it. Yeah. And it just keeps going and going and going and going. And it touches virtually everything in your life. Guess what then begins to happen? You start asking questions. Wow, I'm getting ready to do this. Oh, the upside down world says the way you rule is to be the boss. You get to tell everybody what to do. Well, wait a minute. A three-year-old can do that. <laughs> mine, 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 mine. With, with, without any coaching whatsoever. A three-year-old feels like they're totally capable of ruling the entire house. They'll boss you around. They'll tell you what they'll, they will do, what they won't do, what you will do, what you won't do. Well, guess, guess what? Being the boss it requires no particular skill. It just requires an immature attitude and understanding of what it is to rule. Huh. Okay. So, oh, does that mean I have to learn how to mature in order to effectively rule in your nature and character? Well, how do I do that? Steve, just follow me. Listen to me. I'll teach you how to do this. I'll show you what to do. I'll, I will develop in you the things that I put in you before time began that will literally blow your mind. Well, okay, Lord, let's do that. Yeah. And when you do, Steve, then you'll understand who you are in me and what I designed you to do. Well, what did, I, what did you design me to be? An Elohim man. An Elohim man, what do you mean Elohim man? What is an Elohim man? And then all of a sudden, the thing starts opening up again. You know, you didn't ask the question, but it's certainly, you know, uh, a, part of, a part of the answer is, why don't we know these things? Yeah. Why? Why don't we know the vision that God had for creating. Why do we know that? Why don't we know that what happened in the garden was perfectly according to plan? If I can put angels to keep you out of the garden, then, hey, God, why didn't you put those same angels to keep the serpent out of the garden? Good question, Steve. What would be your answer? Because you intended for that to happen all along. Yeah. You interested in knowing why? Man, am I ever. Okay. Let's chat. Steve, I'll tell you what. You know the truth resonates, you know, it rings. And this is a bit of a, a sidebar here in this, but I just have to stop because it just has such tremendous implications. You know, when something's true and when something's false, right? I mean, and just give you, you know, there's some basic things that we know, you know, you've been standing in line at the DMV and somebody walks up in front, gets in front of, you, you know, you're getting to the back of the line, folks, this isn't right. I've been waiting here for an hour. There's some fundamental things that we know are right and wrong. And I think that, you know, knit within our heart of our very nature that we know we have some discernment of 
big, big issues that are right and wrong. And what's amazing about this is this resonates so deeply as true. And I've been studying this for 23 years, Steve. I've been looking at the same things you've been looking at for 23 years of my life. And it's really interesting to think now, if this world is upside down, and I know that, hey, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. Don't rest on your own understandings and all your ways acknowledge him and it'll make your past straight. Okay, I got to renew my mind. Oh yeah, man is just for the day. Give us this day our daily bread. Don't store it up. It won't last well, unless it's the Sabbath. So there's a structure of how you have set this thing up. And, you know, you said, like, would you like to know? Well, yeah, I'd like to know. But what are the benefits? And so here's the thing that I would say, and this is just a personal testimony of mine. I was so, when I was a kid, I was 12, my son's age, when the church lady basically twisted my arm to make me go for, down front and get saved. Okay. And, oh, this is going to be like this, and it's going to be like that, and it wasn't like this, and it wasn't like that at all. And there was no follow-up, there was nothing. And I was angry. I was angry about it, because I realized I was manipulated. And so I spent the next years of my life, from the ages of 20, I'm sorry, from 12 to 28, basically making fun of Christian people, because they were going along with a manipulation. Okay, so I'm not the guy who was raised in the church and like, oh, daddy was a pastor. No, I was one who would make fun of people who followed this stuff because it it got proven to me that it was not powerful and it was hokey. And I was pretty angry about that in that respect. And, you know, I just kind of went along my way going, I'll figure this out. I'm capable. I'll grab the bull by the horns. I can do this. I got some skills. And it wasn't until I was at the end of myself, right? I got to this point where if I had a gun, I would have put it in my mouth. And I said to him, I said, if you are real and you, you're going to have to show me. And that, that was it. It wasn't like, well, I'm like, you, like if you're real, you got to have some power because this old lady that twisted my arm didn't have any power outside of herself. And I experienced weight lifted off of me to the point where I laughed uncontrollably. Yeah. And it was so, it was proof. And I, in a moment, I knew it. And of course, everybody around me was like, well, well, you need to pray this prayer, son. I'm like, get lost. <laughs> And, you know, and it, like even people that were I hadn't seen in a while, like what happened to you? They would like physically notice something's different. One of the big things is I could sit still. Hmm. One of the results of that experience was I could sit still and I was comfortable in my own skin and I hadn't been before. I was dancing like a monkey for people's approval. And I still do it to to this day, but less so than I did it then. And. So I would say this, and this is where I'd love to take this, is without benefit, without incentive, there really is nothing here. But if we were to kind of tie this to the, the, the reason he made it, and if you think about this life being short, I want to emphasize this big point because this is a humongous aha for me. I read about Enoch. I read about Methuselah. I read about Noah. I read about Abraham. And these people lived a long time. Yeah. If I'm taking the Bible to be true, you know, there's people living a thousand years, but Noah lived 365 years, which is interesting that that's the number of days. Well, it says clearly after the flood and everything that we're only going to be living max 120 years. And in that is an interesting paradigm, which is to say, you know, I lost my father last year and, you know, he, he died. And, I think about that a lot and I go, so you made this shorter intentionally. Yeah. And my dad always said, he was like, man, this is short, man. It's short. I'm like, no, it's not dad. It's not short. He's like, yeah, you'll realize someday it's short. Yeah. And I think you and my dad were actually born in the same year hmm. or close to it. He was 48. And I just, um, you know, I, I recognize and realize, okay, 
if eternity, infinity is available, then the grace of God is actually shortening this boot camp. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an amazing concept to me to say, well, then if that's the case, Steve, and there is this idea that said so many times in the scriptures, you're going to store up treasures in heaven. And that there is so many stories about how you stewarded this life. Yeah. And here we have all these indicators and you're like, hey, you're to rule and reign in my nature and character. And I see that the world's upside down and, you know, on earth this is in heaven. So this is so now the plan and the goal. But he uses me differently than he uses you. And it's custom made for me. And it's custom made for you, which is proof that it was intentional. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And it's like so many people in this world and including myself, I've been like, why in the world am I here? Yeah. And it's like, hold on a second, Steve, we're telling people you're telling me and I'm asking him myself. And he said, yep, 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 yep. That's why I did it. <laughs> and what am I doing? I'm like, I found the very meaning of life. Yeah. This is the meaning of life. Yes. The rule and reign in his nature and character, and it's going to be custom fit to you, and you're going to have the journey of a lifetime, and you're going to deal with so many things, but it's short, and there is something for you to do. So in a way, I think about Navy SEALs. Yeah. Not everybody is a Navy SEAL, and not yeah. everyone's a professional baseball player. And I go, what does God have planned in eternity for you, Steve? He <laughs> knows exactly what he's got planned for you. Yeah, yeah. And he gives you a picture of maybe there's five or ten cities or whatever it is. It's some function of some sort of rank and order, right? There's a real thing to this. And in a way, I think about don't don't store it up where moth and rust will, you know, decay it. Well, what does it mean? Now it becomes apparent to me. As we are good stewards of the things that we've been given and we rule and reign in his nature and character, and we rule, like literally deciding good versus evil, we're animating things for good, that there is a function in the spiritual realm that is an incentive and a reason, and it's not without benefit. Just like the thief on the cross, he's like, today you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah. I go, we're so fearful of death, Steve. Yeah. We're so afraid. And... We've been obviously lied to and, and manipulated. And it's this idea that, well, no wonder his currency is peace and rest. And it's, it's such a big idea. And so many people, I mean, of the absolute highest caliber in sports, in entertainment, in politics, are so discontent. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't it interesting that it's almost like a couple of these notches are turning. You're like, oh, my goodness. I get reordered with the very framework of creation. And I think about that with the money, with all this crypto stuff, Steve. And the implications are absolutely mind-numbing. Yes, they are. Yep. And so here's an interesting... I, I, I'm getting way off track on our my, my plan, but I almost see this integration and this melting or fusing together and revelation almost as if the veil is unzipped and that heaven and earth become one that what we may think of as well jesus returns and we're jettisoned off and this is some sort of you know escape hatch is more of one where this becomes something that's opaque becomes translucent that ultimately becomes fully integrated is that a yeah. good way of thinking about it? Oh, it's a great way of thinking about it. Um, I mean, and what's great is, is virtually everybody on this stream or anyone who ever watches this stream, they will eventually get to the place where they are able to describe it in terms that are meaningful to them that they can then pass on to others. I mean, think about it like this. Once again, we've talked about this and you I think it's part of the where you were going a little bit earlier about, you know, heaven and earth. Um, you know, once again, Jesus 
um, came out of, it, out of his time of prayer, exchanging wishes with the Father. It says if the original language talks about and him being changed um, through that process, which any of us who have gone through that, who have learned to, you know, to exchange like that, to dialogue uh, with Jesus or the Father like that, we know that that's true. There's a very real and fundamental change that happens to us. And the disciple says, teach us how to pray. And he goes through what we, you know, affectionately refer to as the Lord's Prayer, right? And that heaven and earth will come. Well, let me ask you something. Did Jesus live like that when he was on the planet? Were heaven and earth joined when Jesus walked on the planet? Was the Father's will done? Was the kingdom happening on earth as it did in heaven? Well, I think I'd have to say yes. And he said so many times, the kingdom of heaven is near. Right? Well, if the answer is yes, then, huh, was that just reserved for him? Right. Or was that really the answer to the disciple? And by the way, was it also the motivation for the disciple to even ask the question? Jesus, when you pray, stuff happens. There is a change in you. There, everything around you changes. Everything that you touch, everything you speak to, everyone who comes in contact with you is impacted by the will of the Father happening through you, which brings the kingdom on earth exactly as it is in heaven. Is that the answer, Jesus? Are you telling me that's exactly how it works? And is that how I am to learn to pray? That when I sit down and I exchange wishes with you and I learn to be who you created me to be, and I allow you to teach me how your kingdom works, that what happens is our Father's will is done and the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. Whoa. Whoa. Now we're back to the very same thing. Jesus was telling, giving the answer through that the a disciple could observe in the very life dynamic that Jesus was exhibiting to him. This is what it looks like. This is how it functions. This is what it means for God's man to be an Elohim. Do you ever find it fascinating that Jesus almost exclusively talked in terms of the Son of Man? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but I should have a, you know everlasting life. Why did he say son? Why did he not say sent me? If he's the master communicator, why did he why was he not specific? Now, we have assigned to, to that word specificity as relating to him. But he constantly referred to son of man. See, he didn't re he, he almost never talked about himself in the first person when it was intended for the entirety of the Adam anthropos human being. So you sent your son, your one of a kind son. Yeah, Steve, you want to be a one of a kind son? You want to learn how that happens? Well, yeah, I would. Well, watch what happens when that occurs. All kinds of stuff starts coming into alignment. My will begins to happen 
And when my will happens, my kingdom comes. And when my kingdom is there, guess what happens? Life, liberty, all of the things that come with my kingdom and with my design. Hey, you want to do that, Steve? Oh, Lord, do I ever. Will you teach me? See, that's the message for this group. I'm not trying to get anybody to accept any belief system or doctrinal premise. It's, hey, listen, the planet is decaying. And Jesus is in the process of raising up the alternative. Do you want to be a part of the alternative or do you want to go the way of the rotten peach? Okay. It's a choice. Choose. Which one do you want to do? The transfer is happening. It's going to occur. Who is Jesus going to transfer the kingdom of the world to? Anybody listening to this stream that says, Jesus, I'd like you to transfer to some stuff to me. Not so I can be somebody, but that I can be who you designed me to be and I can fulfill the role that you've assigned to me from before time began. I want to do that with you. Jesus, well, will you prepare me to do that? You've said in a real practical way, you said to me once, you said, well, what would it look like if you, if you ran Texas? What would it look like if you, if you, ruled and reigned in his nature and character. And, and this gets us to that concept of all mechanisms or tools or neutral. Yes. And you, you think about that. Well, what does it look like if I rule and reign my family in his nature and character and I bless and protect those? Well, there's, well, what's the implications of that? Well, what does it look like when I utilize a tool and animate it for good in lead and rule over it in his nature and character? What does it look like when Texas is led in his nature and character? What does it look like when his man partners with him to execute the authority that he has over politics or business or family or your own body itself? What an amazing picture. And you said it the other day, you said, you know, this could happen in a month. It could flip in a month. And you know what's interesting about this is I think the essence of this, we've seen this throughout history. We've seen great awakenings. We've seen, I, I think about the early church, right? People, what did they do? They committed themselves to the apostles' teaching. What did they likely learn? This? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Son of Man. Like We're like him. And I love how C.S. Lewis talked about it. He's like, you're like mini Christs. That's what, what the terminology he used. And I love yeah. it because so many people are wanting to tell you that you're 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 lowly, you're lower than the angels, you don't have value. And what Jesus is saying, you're a son. That means yeah. you're an extension of me. What does Elohim man mean? But you have the divine in you. But without yeah. me, you can do nothing. And so many people on the new age side of things are like, no, I can do everything without you. Yeah. And what they're doing is they're identifying the divine in them. It's like they see a piece of it. They're like, yeah, we got power. We got authority and all this stuff, but we're going to go our own way. We're going to do that apart from you. And in a way, what I see in this world is you're just the descendants of a monkey. You know, you are, you're lower than the animals. We've turned it upside down. And this idea of being right side up is not one of lording and hoarding. That's right. It's like, no, you're an extension of... <sighs> It's amazing, you know, Legion, th these many, many demons were in this man, and they recognized Jesus. Yeah. And I've had experiences like that, Steve. I went, I was in actually for a hex event in, in uh, Las Vegas. And this guy came across the room, got up in my face to the point where I could smell his breath. And he, mm -hmm. he literally looks at me, kind of twists his head, and he goes, I see Jesus in your eyes. And then he leaves. <laughs> And it freaked me out. And I was like, I was just doing normal stuff, talking to people about Pulse Chain and Hex. And here's this guy just butts his way in and looks at me and turns his head sideways and, and leaves. Like, we don't have a conversation. And I'm like, what is it that you're doing, Lord? How are you? What are people seeing? And, you know, you think about that and you go, this idea of being, you know, 
set aside in some respects, but also it gives me this deep desire to want to be one of the called out ones that chases after him and goes, all right, what'd you mean by that? Yes. So would you talk about what it means to be in the game? Cause that's that component of it, right? It's like, well, yeah, I got some interest. You're making a pretty good case for this, but I can't just tell you about it. You got to try it on for size. You got to kind of ask him yourself. What does it mean to be in the game? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, first of all, what it, what it doesn't mean. And I'm going to talk in our very first stream. Um, I shared that we are taught to be um, event oriented. And when we're event oriented, we are the, then driven by circumstances. We make decisions based on the circumstances that are in front of us. And so we're constantly reacting to the circumstances because we are event oriented. As a, and what that does is that always puts us behind the curve. We are then in the control of the one who created the supposed event that is there to capture our eyes. In contrast to Jesus, who is very strategic in the way that he operates, that everything that he does is in the context of achieving the strategy that is assigned for whatever that um, event finds itself within. And so learning to make that transition from, you know, from being event oriented to um, more of a strategic orientation is a huge, huge leap. Um, for, and here would be a picture of this. Let's go into the, into the baseball world. Um, I, can, I can sit on the sidelines in the stands and watch every game of my home team every year for as long as I live. And I can gain a whole lot of knowledge about the game by observing and watching it. That will not provide me with one ounce of benefit once I step on the field. Not one. I will, just because I know what a curveball does doesn't mean I can throw a curveball. Just because I know how what how to I watch Hank Aaron hit a curveball doesn't mean I can hit a curveball. In order to be in the game, you have to actually step on the field, get in the game, and accept the risk that comes with failure. Okay? I have to be willing to accept the pain, disappointment, risk of failing in order to learn how to achieve. That through the process of failure, I learn how to achieve. Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to get my lunch handed to me in order to get to the place where I can start handing out lunch? Mm. Okay. I mean, that's a big, that's a big deal. And so if you're going to be in the game, you can't sit on the sidelines and talk about it, read about it, study it, become an expert intellectually. You actually have to step on the field because your intellectual awareness will not do one ounce of good for you in the game. The game is very different in it than what is observed apart from it. Well, that's crypto, man. It's so the picture of crypto as well. You Is know, it? I watch, yeah, I watch the charts, I listen to these streamers. I, you know, pay attention to the news. And what's amazing about crypto is it it's such a neat analogy because it fits so well is that here you've got this immutable contract on the blockchain. Let's just call it Texan or Hex or Ophir or something. And you have the keys, right? People, people make the assumption they have the coins. They don't have the coins. They have the keys to the blockchain that gives them the right to do certain things with that value. And it's this idea of, well, knowing about hacks and knowing about 
you know, all of these things, all those T shares and you get this and it burns and then it mints and it does this and that. That's different than actually engaging with the contract, right? Actually holding T shares actually. And you know, I, I come in and I see this all the time, like right now in our community, there's something going on behind the scenes that's pumping price in some new assets and dealing with you know these copies of stable coins and there's some there's a little bit of mystery around it um Hmm. there's some big players involved in it um but in a way you're right like this risk of failure like i can't benefit from the gains if i'm not in the trade if i have not actually engaged with it and it's kind of simple But it's exactly what you're saying is that there's so many people sitting on the sidelines of all of this and kind of outsourcing the game to others. And, you know, it's it's interesting now that I I reflect on things like why it's so hard as a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. This idea that, hold on a second, do I really want to let go of these things that I've amassed for myself? Right. You know, well, you've received your reward in full. You know, do you understand how this game is and do you want to enter it? Well, follow me. And what a neat, what an amazing thing, too, because the more you drill into it, the more you realize the calling of the disciples is the same call today. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it was the same in the garden. Yeah. Let us make man in our image and our likeness and let us give him, you know, dominion over the earth to rule. Well, when when that happened, um, what was the intention to, in man's ruling of the earth? Was it that he was just going to go off on his own? Well, no, that obviously wasn't it because Jehovah put two trees in the garden. He said, one you can feast on, that's the tree of life. Have at it. It's all yours. The other one, knowledge of good and good and evil. Don't mess with that. Well, what is that a picture of? Ruling with me. Because you're going to be tempted to deal with that, with that tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's going to be times when you're not going to know what to do, or you think you have it nailed. You know exactly what to do. Don't go that route. See, this is designed to operate with, with me, to rule with me. So what I will do is I will show you the way that leads to life. That's that tree of life. Feast on that all you want. But to, in order to feast on that, you got to do it with me. Because I'm the way, the truth, and the life. See? I'm the guy. This is, this is what I am assigned to do, just like you're assigned to do something. This is what the Father has assigned me to do. This is my role. In the way that you have a role, I have a role. So that together, we have a role. To do what? To learn how to rule my father's creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. And when you do that, all that the father has intended is unlocked for you. That sounds something you're interested in? Man, I'm, man, how come nobody's talking to me like this? I know. How come nobody's telling me about like this? This is so basic and fundamental. What? Why not? That's what I want to do. Well, and you think about the, if we do have an adversary, right? And there is one that lies and there's one that wants to get our authority. You know, I look at, you know, those that I run into who are kind of steeped in the traditions of the church. And, you know, one of the things people don't hear us talking about is salvation on these streams. No. And it's a big one for people to get really hung up on it. And one of the things that's amazing about this is Jesus never said to the disciples, get saved. He said, follow me. Yeah. That's it. And you think about it. Well, why at that time you're like, well, if I was there, I'd follow him because he was real and I could see him. And what is it so incredible to me is, you know, when he, you know, he, he's resurrected, right? He appears to them and he's going to leave. And he's like, no, I'm sending you one. 
and the, I just love the whole connection to crypto in that God's design is one of abundance and decentralization. And he literally, I love it so much, said, hey, I'm going to send one to help you, right? The spirit that will remind you of everything I said. Yeah. And it's so amazing to me that we have all this buttressing support. It's not just like, well, I hope you find it. No, no, no. I've, I've fortified it with all these things. The cre creation, you can look at the seed and see that it's abundant. You can see it in the, the, the heavens declare. You're going to see it in the child. You're going to see it in your family. You're going to see it in other people. I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be like yelling at you in a wonderful sort of way of how, how, what I made and who I am and how, and to think that we've been deceived and, and almost, you know, and I'd love for you to share this story once again, because I can't share it the way you share it. Will you share the story of going to Lydia's in Macedonia? And will you share this, what seemed to be true and was the directive? And this is how I see the church right now. It's like, well, you're supposed to get saved and, and go get some food for hungry people. And you're like, hold on a second. You know, kind of like what the slave girl said. These are the sons of the Most High God who have come for salvation. Can you tell that story again? Because I think in that encapsulates so much here that why would we want to ask him, right? Why would we want to engage directly with the source of Jesus himself? Because we could easily be deceived by another. Yeah. Well, this, yeah, this is, um, is a great example of the event orientation versus the strategic orientation that we're, um, we just talked about a minute ago. If you go into the story in Acts 16 is where you can, you can go look at the story. Uh, it begins by Paul and his company um, completing their previous, you know, mission, their previous task. And so now they're looking what to do now that they've completed that task. And so they start to head to one place and, and it says, and the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow them. Um, and then it says, then they decided to go to another place. And it says the spirit of Jesus forbid them. And right off the bat, you go, oh, wow, what's the difference between the Holy Spirit and the spirit of Jesus? And more importantly, do I know the difference? You know, is that different, distinguished? Am I, have my spiritual senses been trained sufficiently to know the difference between when the Holy Spirit is speaking to me versus the Spirit of Jesus? So right off the bat, you know, your brain is just kind of taken, you know, to a place that it's never been before. So anyway, um, then Paul has a dream about a man saying to him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so they decided that that's where they were going to go. So they headed to Macedonia, and it says they entered into the leading city of Macedonia, which was Philippi, which is interesting is, you know, um, the same, same source as Philippines. And so that, you and I have had that very interesting, you know, conversation. And so... Um, so they were, they were in Philippi, nothing much was happening, and they run across uh, this group of ladies who were praying down by the river, and um, it speaks in particular of one whose name was Lydia, who was a, um, she was a maker of fine fabrics. Purple fabrics, I think, is what was identified in particular, which speaks of royalty. And so they go down and they befriend and um, Lydia, then invites them to become, you know, to come and live with her. And at first they say, no, 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 we can't do that. But then it says, and it says the language is, but she prevailed upon us. And so we, um, we then, implication is we then went ahead and were hanging out with, uh, with Lydia. Now what's fascinating from a spiritual engagement standpoint, this strategic thing we're talking about, as nothing had happened with Paul and his company uh, up to that point, as long as they had not yet established residency, which then in the establishing of residency establishes standing, you know, earthly standing. Well, we know that in our own company, country, right? 
Yep. You don't you don't get to come here unless you have permission to come here, and that gives you standing for a brief period of time, leading all the way up to citizenship. Once you have the standing as a citizen, you have all kinds of authority that you did not previously possess as a visitor. Same concept. So um, it then says, and the next day as they were going out, they were met with a young woman. And the way Luke described it, now remember, Luke is describing this as he's looking back on it. So when he's writing, you know, the book of Acts, he's now recounting events and, and, um, and situations that he's now looking back on and then describing uh, for the benefit of his readers. And he said, this young woman came out and the way that the translators put it is possessed of a, uh, of a spirit of divination. That's the primary way it's just interpreted. Well, okay, I'll ask, you know, you and the audience, what is it to be possessed by the spirit of divination? What is a spirit of divination? Anybody out there know? Pause and think about it. Do you even know what that means? If you don't know what that means, then guess what? It's meaningless to you. So let's give it some meaning. So when you go, when you go into those words, um, what's happening is that um, this word divination is the word puthon. And puthon in, uh, would be translated into English as python. Wow. So what, so what Luke was saying is this woman was captured by, possessed and controlled by the spirit of Python. Well, anybody out there know what the spirit of Python is? Well, probably not. So let's go into the spirit of Python because this is really significant. The spirit of Python, Python was part of the Greek pantheon. Um, and it was a snake, and this snake had a forked tongue, and this snake possessed the ability to prophesy. It was the god of prophecy. And so this snake, which was very, very powerful, would speak to you, and it would speak to you with a forked tongue, meaning sometimes it would speak to you with the true side. If it liked you, it would tell you the truth of the future. If it didn't like you, it would, te it would talk to you from the falsehood side of, his, of its tongue and speak a lie to you. Other times it would just screw with you and then it would speak in ways that were um, incongruous to where you didn't really know what it meant so it could have double meaning. And so often when people wanted to understand what, the, what one possessed of the spirit of Python would prophesy, they would then go to the, to the local temple. In that case, it would have been the Oracle of Delphi and it would go in there into the temple and it would get an interpretation about what the spirit of Python said. So when Luke said, this young woman was possessed by the spirit of Python, well, okay, wow, that's what it said, but what did the local residents or the readers then hear when they heard Python? Well, in the Greek pantheon, in the Greek system, a religious system, once a god possessed um, a certain power, in this case, the spirit of prophecy, that spirit of prophecy belonged to that god alone. And there's only two ways that that, that power could be transferred. One, either by way of that spirit relinquishing it and giving it to another, or by, by way of conquest. Another god could come in, engage in battle, and then seize that by conquest, which would then mean the killing of, in this case, Python. Well, that's what Apollo did. Apollo was the, was the um, youthful god of Zeus. In, in parallel, he would be the, um, the pseudo-Jesus, he would be the artificial counterfeit Jesus. And that's a much longer conversation, but that's he was the son of God. And he possessed all kinds of attributes um, 
He was the God of light. He was the God of the sun. He was God of healing. He was the God of music and the arts. He was the God. He was the most powerful, most um, revered God in the entire Greek pantheon, even above Zeus, especially among the folks in Macedonia and in Philippi. And so what, what, um, what Apollo wanted is Apollo wanted to be able to round out his skill set. And so he engaged conquest with Python, killed him, and now he was the god of prophecy. So why am I telling you all, you all of this? Because when Luke was writing that this woman was possessed of a spirit of divination the way the translators are translating it, they're not telling you the story. They're telling you the story that this woman was under the full possession and control of Apollo. And Apollo was the ruling spirit in Macedonia. And so what happened is that the moment they gained um, residency, they uh, secured standing in the leading city called Philippi, and Apollo immediately dispatched his servant to go prophesy to Paul and his company. Apollo did that. Okay. Now, what did Apollo, what was the message that Apollo sent, Apollo sent through the young woman, his agent? Remember that whole con idea of agent earlier? Yep. To Paul and his company. Here's what Apollo prophesied to them. These men are the bond servants of the Most High God who have come to proclaim to you the way of salvation. What's wrong with those words? Is there anything that you can find in those words that we would not consider at first blush to be true? No. Nope. These men are bond servants of the Most High God who have come come to proclaim to you the way of salvation. Okay, if those are correct, then the next question is, what benefit did Apollo see by sending his subjects to Paul and his company to get saved? Why would he do that? Distraction. Right on. Distraction. Okay, here's the next question then. If he was going to send Paul and his company to go get saved, then what was a then what threat did Apollo consider getting saved to be to him and his rule? A non-issue. A non-issue. That's humongous. Okay. See, I'm talking strategy. Yep. I'm not talking about event. See, I'm not talking about the idea of salvation. I'm not talking about bonds. I'm, not, I'm talking about this is, the, this is the strategic play that happens in the spiritual world of which we are a part. So let me, let me this, I'm just reflecting back to you what I'm hearing because it's so powerful. And if you think about this, if the spirit of Apollo is using this prophecy let's say as a distraction, as a, as a tool, right. And it's being used intentionally and strategically for a reason. This was annoying to Paul, right? This annoyed him. And so think about this, what I think people would say, yeah, that's a true statement. They were here to save people, right. And they're sending them to them. Imagine what the implications are of Paul casting out that spirit. It's, it, the implications are like, wow, tremendous. Can you tell us what was the what the effect of 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 Paul basically going get behind me, Satan here? Well, yeah, it 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 has a similar effect of what happens when you start going into the garden and thinking that the serpent didn't catch God off guard. Okay, did was Jesus caught off guard? When Paul and his company came in and all of a sudden Apollo dispatched his servant, the young woman, to start prophesying over them. 
And did that catch Jesus off guard? Well, now you're right back to the end of the garden discussion. Did you know that this was going to happen, Jesus? Or is this something that just kind of, you know, you, somebody slipped you a Mickey and you didn't quite understand what was going on here? What it says is, what it, what it does is it starts giving you the opportunity to learn some of the strategic elements that happen, which we've described. But the other thing is, is this happened for many days. And it says, and after many days, Paul became annoyed. And that word annoyed is worn out, um, frustrated, confused, um, you know, irritated. I mean, it just got into the core of him. Okay. Well, the first question is, why did it take many days? I actually went back in there and looked at it, and I, and I calculated one time this could have been going on for as long as a couple of years. So this is not something that happened for, for a day or two or a week or two. This happened for many days. Okay. And then all of a sudden, one day, all this whole annoyance thing happened. Well, what was he doing? He was ingesting the prophetic word that was coming out, and that prophetic word that he heard was starting to bear its fruit in his spirit and in his soul, and he recognized that this was not the spirit of peace talking to him. This was the spirit of evil that was bearing its fruit in him. And then it says, and he turned. Well, what do we call turning inside the church? We call it repentance. So Paul was going in one direction, and all of a sudden he turned. And when he turned, back now back to your, back to your question, he rebuked and severed the link between Apollo and his earthly agent. And when he did that, Paulo was now left without any earthly agency with which to uh, engage uh, and enforce his power. So now that spiritual link is severed. Well, I'm wondering if that's where Paul learned that our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers. Okay? And then, so what was the first thing that happened? Once, once that linkage was severed, what happened? Oh my goodness, the economic order was turned upside down. And it says of the owners, the, the men who owned the woman and their financial, all of their financial well-being was now put at, put at risk. And the entirety of the city now was turned upside down. Why? Because the economic order was turned upside down from whom they gained much profit. So just like what Jesus had done in the temple by turning the money changers upside down, where he disrupted and turned upside down the economic order that was plundering God's people, he did exactly the same, th the same thing in uh, Philippi uh, to turn that economic order upside down. And when that was turned upside down, what did the people do? They totally freaked out. They freaked out and they threw, they threw Paul and his company in prison. And when they got in prison, who did they meet? The guard and his family who were calling out and saying, Jesus, I'd like to get to know you. And Jesus said, yep, I can make that happen. I can arrange that for you. <laughs> hey, I mean, wow. Who talks about this stuff? It's so powerful. You know what it reminds me of as I think about the, the church I've been involved in for a long time now. And these good intentions, right? And you're, what, what this story really illustrates is what a fine line we walk at times to be on guard and aware. Because yeah. I think about this, you know, the, the workings of the church. And I've known a number of pastors and my wife's friends with a pastor's wife and i know the how the sausage is made at church and i see a structure that's been set up and well how are you a good christian at church 
well, you go along with the program. And I think about this, this story as it relates to that is that we, the barrier has been torn, right? This, this veil has been torn down. We have access directly to the one that created it all. All things were made for him and by him. And we are saying, Jesus is available to you. He's alive and he speaks. And so here's Paul and his company going, we want to know, Jesus, what you want us to do. And yeah. to think that something that is good, that seems right, which I see in the church all the time. Well, we need to go do this, and the kids are doing this, and we need to feed these people and do this thing, and they're good things. Yeah. Are they the mission and calling that Jesus has told you to do? Because if you think about this as a distraction, what if they said, yeah, we're bond servants of the Most High God, come get saved, that in a way that actually was keeping you from doing the thing that Jesus had for you to do. And to think about this, could you imagine that your cell saving people is actually the antithesis of what Jesus wants from you? Well, in particular, because it's, not, it's now back to what we were talking about earlier. If the way that we are trained to think is upside down, then everything we hear when it's spoken into that upside down grid is going to become perverted. It's going to be, it's going to be interpreted according to that upside down model. Well, what did Jesus just do in that illustration? See, he asked the question, if you listen to him, what strategic benefit did Apollo see that would cause him to send his people to Paul and his company to get saved. Well, I don't know what strategic benefit that would be. Okay, we'll deal with that in just a moment. Here's the next question. What threat did Apollo see by his people getting saved? None whatsoever. Yeah, and no why is that such a big deal to you? Well, Jesus, I don't know, because that's what I've been taught. Okay, do you want to be taught differently? Yeah. So you know what and, I... And so it it just, now we're back to the courage that it takes to stand and yeah. say, okay, man, am I? <laughs> what do we do now? Well, and it's so much, you know, the, the vernacular of the church right now is, are you saved? Right. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people think of it in terms of fire insurance for heaven. Right. And it's it's very transactional and it's a moment in time. And it seemed like, well, notch this one off on our belt. You're taken care of next. Right. Transaction, next transaction, next transaction. What's really amazing about this is this idea that if I can convince you that the core thing to do is to get saved, then what is the teaching that follows? The teaching that follows is really interesting because we, I, I told you the other day, our Bible church guy said, you need to come underneath the authority of the Bible. And I'm like, uh-uh, no. the Bible's a book. I need to come under the authority of the living Jesus who speaks and is alive. Yeah, right on. Now, if I pressed him on that, he'd be like, well, yeah, yeah, but. And, and I think about it for a second. Well, that's exactly the same thing. Yeah. Is you're basically saying, let me reduce this down to something that, is ultimately a distraction to say, well, if I can get you to think that this is a transactional moment in time, then you won't take the time to listen to Jesus on what he wants you to do. And it's so threatening to the hierarchy and order of a church organization in a community because you don't want a bunch of people going their own way, Steve. Yeah. What do you mean all these people are listening to Jesus? They're doing some crazy things. We're supposed to have control of them. And I look at it, and I'm like, wow. So is this essentially the spirit of the church that is one in which is trying to neuter you by getting you to do good things that seem on their surface to be good, but are not? It's a form of godliness, but denying its power. It literally does not have any teeth because, yeah, I'm just going to wear you out. And how many times have people in ministry been like, well, I've just been so worn out by this stuff? Well, yeah, that's because, you know, the things of Jesus are life-giving. Yeah. And people, I think, think that, 
you know, well, if you're fatigued over this stuff, that's your suffering for Jesus. No, that may be actually your distraction from Jesus. It's the evidence of the fruit by it. The, a tree will be known by its fruit. In Paul's instance, he saw the fruit. There was enough period of time where that seed had, had produced its fruit. And when Paul recognized what it was, that's when he said, wait a minute, this is not the spirit of God speaking to me. This is some other spirit. And that's when, when he turned. What's fascinating, now let's go, let's kind of complete the story. This was all the strategic intention of Jesus to begin with in order to open up Macedonia to the gospel. Okay, and what have we been talking about all session long here today and before? the gospel. Hey, the good news is the kingdom is legit. Yeah. This is the real deal. This, this is not some religious hocus pocus. This isn't some fantasy. This is the real deal. That's the good news. This isn't some religious fantasy. This is it, man. This is how it works. It's you the want truth. to know? Yeah. Get in the game. Yep. Be interested. Get in the game and you'll find out exactly how real it is. And it, you know, so... What happened is now completing the story on, on Jesus' side, because Paul and his company went into uh, Macedonia under the authority and with the authority of Jesus, they were operating in the theater of life. And Jesus was luring the spirit of Apollo into that, into that theater of light. And the moment he was fully secured in that theater of light, guess what happened to Paul? who was in the light. He saw the, the fruit of the words, of the prophetic words that were being spoken to him by Apollo. And he saw them for what they were. Okay? And he turned and said, dude, you're done. Severed. And the whole of Macedonia, if you read the rest of the story through Acts, the whole of Macedonia was opened up to the gospel. That's not the preaching of Christianity. That is the, the good news that this is the real deal. This is how it works. Apollo is no match for Jesus. You well, want to go there? Let's go there. Well, and you, you talked about being able to discern between lookalikes. This is about as close as a lookalike as there gets. Yeah. Right. And it shows you how crafty and how, you know, how, well, one, strategic Jesus is, but also on guard we have to be. Yeah. And just be aware, being in the game is this practice of being able to determine between lookalikes. Well, Steve, we have managed to get through <laughs> two hours and 20 minutes of this in episode 21. And every one that we do is like my favorite one. And this has been my favorite one again. Um, I want to I, I wrap this up with the crypto connection again. Yeah. Steve, it has been such a joy to journey with you. And you've been seeing these things in our kind of private conversations around the modern day Philippi, which is the Philippines. Yeah. And folks, if you're paying attention and you've lasted this long, you're like, bless for you. Bless <laughs> you. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to drop some alpha on you. This is for the insiders. The amazing, miraculous things that we're seeing within our team and the work that we're doing, where everyone around us is just belly aching about the bear market. We have such joy. And why do we have such joy? Because Jesus himself is showing us the way. And in the modern day Philippi, which is the Philippines, we've been given opportunities to tokenize real world assets. And that the structure of the very creation that God made, meaning the gold, the silver, the, the value that is not placed there by man, we're going to have a, a tremendous opportunity to tokenize and bring those assets into um, liquidity, into the Pulse chain, into DeFi itself. And it is one of these things where you just sit back and go, I'm watching the miraculous, like Old Testament burning bushes happening in front of us. And to be aligned and experience this adventure of walking with him and him being in front and us recognizing his voice and following him and carrying the poles of the ark, not putting our hand to it is one of the greatest joys ever. 
and we get to like high five and we're happy about it. We're like, wow, this is amazing. But it's also an indication to that. There is something really special happening. This transfer that Steve talks about, we're witnessing it. We're seeing it. And I believe that Jesus is looking for people who are also seeing this, that there's work to be done. And so I just give you a little bit of view into this to recognize that, you know, this isn't just, hey, let's do some, you know, have a have a stream. No, the real purpose of this is we're, we're playing out and investigating and speaking about the very nature and framework of creation. And the more that we understand what our purposes are here, the more it is that we participate in this transfer, which is the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And it's real. And if I told you the stories of the things that have happened over the last 30 days, you wouldn't believe me. You'd be like, no, that's just in a way that you, well, we didn't do it ourselves. There is one that goes before us and is strategic. And so I'm just so excited and thankful because there is hope. Do I have every like, you know, clarity? Do I have clarity on everything that'll happen? No, no, it's, it's a journey and it's, um, um, it's exciting, but also it has tremendous implications because just like when Paul called out Apollo and severed with the agent, it's happening again. And I believe that out of this becomes a new economic order. And I think you are attracted to this and you see this because you see and notice the same things, that you know something is afoot. And it is so exciting because to think that we have a role to play and that he would desire to partner with us and us partner with him and that in that becomes peace and joy and good news is absolutely, it blows my hair back. And I'm just, um, I'm just uh, full and thankful. So, Steve, you are the agent in which Jesus is used to help so many people understand and and make him more accessible. And the truth rings; it resonates. Mm -hmm. So, thank you so much. And we got to like three things on the list. <laughs> We got next week <laughs> we do we do so steve thank you so much have a great weekend anything you want to share with anybody before we go nah just go ahead thanks folks for for hanging in there with us yes thanks steve all right we've done it again i'll catch you in a minute all right folks how about that thanks for sticking around so many you know it's um i, I i'm constantly reminded of that story i tell it all the time Jesus pushes back in the boat, right? And all these people are listening to this agricultural story and then people go home and there's a group of people who chase after him. That's you and me. And we're like, Hey, what'd you mean? What'd you mean by that? That's all Steve's done all his life, right? Since 1982, at least, especially he's just like, what'd you mean by that? Hey, what'd you, what'd you mean? Like, how does it work? Like in these constant like questions and you know, it's amazing to me that I think we will find ourselves as we seek him and we desire to know how it was all designed is we will find ourselves in positions of authority and literally be ruling and reigning in his nature and character. That's the, the trajectory of all this stuff. And I think about what are the implications of ruling and reigning in his nature and character and what does it mean to bless and protect? It sounds like abundance to me. And to think that this whole crypto thing is way more than about freedom of speech and freedom of movement, but it is also about those things. And so why do I do this? And people are like, well, this is a crypto channel. Why are you talking about Jesus? Because you know what? All of this fits into the very framework of, the, of this creation. And there's no mistake that this is happening now, but we're going to take this tool of crypto and we are going to animate it for good. Take care of yourself. Thanks for uh, joining the stream, and we'll catch you next week. Take care, everybody.